This is Vedas Zutki greeting you, our beloved friends in the Lord. The tape you're about to hear was given by Duncan Campbell himself in Vibroco, Wisconsin in May of 1968. Duncan Campbell is from Edinburgh, Scotland, and came to Vibroco with Dr. Leonard Ravenhill, who is also from England and who closes in prayer following this message on the Hebrides revival. We pray that God will use this report of his faithfulness in the Hebrides to stir our own hearts to go to God in prayer and ask him for an outpouring of his Holy Spirit upon us in our day. There are two things that I like to say in speaking about the revival in the Hebrides. First, I like to make it perfectly clear that I did not bring revival to the Hebrides. It has grieved me beyond words to hear people talk and write about the man that brought revival to the Hebrides. My dear people, I didn't do that. A revival was there before I ever set foot on the island. It began in a gracious awareness of God sweeping through the parish of Barba. Uh, then uh, I like to make it perfectly clear what I understand by revival. When I speak of revival, I'm not thinking of high-pressure evangelism. I'm not thinking of crusades or of special efforts convened and organized by man. That is not in my mind at all. Revival is something altogether different. Uh, from evangelism on its highest level. Thank God for all that has been accomplished through evangelism. I represent a mission in Scotland that uh, does much in the field of evangelism. We have at least about a hundred workers in our mission. And we thank God for all that has been accomplished through their efforts down through the years. But uh, when I think of their efforts, I'm not thinking of revival. I know that in this country you very often speak of having uh, revival meetings. Now, that is something that I just can't understand. I think it would be better for you to speak of your efforts as evangelistic meetings or evangelistic efforts, because that is not revival. That is not revival. Revival is a moving of God in the community and suddenly the community becoming God conscious before a word is said by any man representing any special effort. Now I'm sure you'll be interested to know how this gracious movement began on the island of Louis. Now, the island of Lewis is a very prosperous island, an island of uh, 37,000 inhabitants. I say a prosperous island, perhaps more prosperous than many other parts of rural Scotland. The tweed industry there is booming, and men are making fortunes. I might also say that the island of Lewis produces more graduates from our universities in uh, Scotland and in England than in any other part of Great Britain on an average basis. They produce more graduates, as a matter of fact, more ministers and doctors come from the island of Lewis than from any other part of Scotland on an average basis. The captain, as a matter of fact, the captain of one of the queens is from the parish where the revival broke out. Now that gives you a slight faint idea of the island into which God came in November of 49. This is how it began. Uh, two old women, one of them 84 years of age and the other 82, one of them stone blind, were greatly burdened because of the appalling state of their own parish. It was true that not a single young person attended public worship. Not a single young man or young woman went to the church. 
spent uh, their day perhaps reading or walking, but uh, the church was left out of the picture. And uh, those two women were greatly concerned and they made it a special matter of prayer. And this is the verse that gripped them. I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. That is God's promise. We believe that God is a covenant-keeping God that must be true to his covenant engagement. He has made a promise and he must fulfill the promise. These were the thoughts uppermost in their mind. Now I believe that the prayers of those two women moved the presbytery of Louis to do something. And uh, the presbytery met every minister in the presbytery representing the island of Louis met in the town of Stornoway uh, to discuss and to consider the situation of the island spiritually. And at that the presbytery meeting they passed a resolution calling, and calling upon all their faithful people uh, to view with deep concern the terrible drift away from God and the barrenness spiritually of the whole parish. That resolution was read in all the churches on the following Sabbath and uh, printed in two of the local papers in the county. Now I'm not prepared to say what uh, impression that made upon the people in general nor upon the ministers in particular, but of this I am certain <coughs> that it was taken to heart in the parish of Barber and particularly by the two old women that I've already referred to. They were so burdened that both of them decided to spend so much time in prayer twice a week. On Tuesday they got on their knees at 10 o'clock in the evening and remained on their knees until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Two old women in a very humble cottage. One night one of the sisters had a vision. Now remember that in revival God one works in wonderful ways. Vision came to one of them and in the vision she saw the church of her father crowded with young people. Packed to the door and a strange minister standing in the pulpit. And she was so impressed by the vision that she sent for the parish minister. And, of course, he, knowing the two sisters, knowing that they were two women who knew God in a wonderful way, he responded to their invitation and called at the court. That morning, one of the sisters said to the minister, You must do something about it. And I would suggest that you call your office bearers together and uh, that you spend with us at least two nights in prayer in the week. Tuesday and Friday, if you gather your elders together, uh, you can meet in a barn, a farming community, you can meet in a barn, and uh, as you pray there, we'll pray here. And uh, the minister, being a God-fearing man, a well-saved man. Of course, in Lewis, you couldn't possibly have anybody else. They wouldn't have a man that couldn't give a clear testimony as to his conversion, how he came to know God. But that is true of that part of God's vineyard, notwithstanding the appalling situation that prevailed at that time. Well, that was what happened. The minister called his office bearers together, <laughs> and seven of them met in a barn, uh, to pray on Tuesday and on Friday and the two old women got on their knees and prayed with them. Well that continued uh, for some weeks indeed, I believe almost a month and a half until one night now this is what I'm anxious that you get a hold of. One night they're kneeling there in the barn praying Pleading this promise, I will pour water on him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. When one young man, a deacon in the church, 
Go to that and read Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of God? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing, not our blessing, but the blessing of the Lord. And then that young man closed his Bible. And looking down at the minister and the other office bearer, he said this, very crude words, but perhaps not so crude in our Gaelic language. He said, it seems to me so much humbug to be praying as we are praying, to be waiting as we are waiting, if we ourselves are not rightly related to God. And then he lifted his two hands. I am telling you just as the minister told me what happened. He lifted his two hands and prayed, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? But he got no fuss. That young man, first of all, fell on his knees. And then fell into a trance. Now, don't ask me to explain this because I cannot. Fell into a trance and is now lying on the floor of the barn. But in the words of the minister, at that moment, he and his other office bearers were gripped by the conviction that a God-sent revival must ever be related to holiness, must ever be related to godliness. Are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? The man that God will trust to revive. That's the conviction. When that happened in the bar, the power of God swept into the parish, and an awareness of God gripped the community, such as hadn't been known for over a hundred years. An awareness of God, that's revival. That's revival. And on the following day, the looms were silent. Little work was done on the farm as men and women gave themselves to thinking on eternal things, gripped by eternal reality. Now, I wasn't on the island when that happened. But uh, again, one of the sisters sent for the minister and said to him, I think you ought to invite someone to the parish I cannot give a name but God must have someone in his mind because we saw a strange man in the book and that man must be somewhere well the minister that week was going to the Strath Pepper convention one of our great conventions in uh, Scotland and at that convention he met uh, a young man who was a student with him in college, knowing that this young man was a God-fearing man, a man with a message, he invited him uh, to the island. Well, won't you come for ten days, a ten-day special effort? We've had so many of them during the past number of years, but we feel that something is happening in the parish and we would like you to attend. This minister said no. I don't feel that I'm the man, but quite recently there's been a very remarkable move in Partick in Glasgow under the ministry of a man by the name of Campbell. I would suggest that you send for him. Now at that time I was in the college in Edinburgh. It wasn't very easy for me to leave, but it was decided that I should go for ten days for ten days uh, to the parish of Barbas to conduct a series of meetings in the parish church there. Well, the day came when I arrived. Perhaps I ought to tell you that to begin with, a letter was sent to the minister to say that it was impossible for me to go at that time as I was involved in a holiday convention somewhere else at that time and uh, wasn't 
free to go, but, but I would put Lewis on my program for the following year. And the minister got that letter, he went to the old ladies and told the story. And the blind sister said, that is what man is saying, but God has said otherwise. And the man, whoever he is, is going to be here within ten days. Here were women who knew God, who were in touch with the eternal. The secret of the Lord was them that fear him, and they knew the secret. Well, to make a long story short, I was on the island within ten days. I shall never forget the night that I arrived at the pier, crossed the minch in the mail steamer, found myself standing in the presence of the minister whom I had never seen and two of his elders that I never knew. And as I stood there, one of the elders came over to me and said, uh, Mr. Campbell, I would like to ask you a question before you leave us here. Are you walking with God? <coughs> And I immediately realized that I was in the presence of men who feared God. I said to him, well, I think I can say this, that I fear God, that I fear God. And he put his hand on my shoulders and said, that will do, that will do. In other words, I think we can trust him. The minister turned to me and said, now, we know, Mr. Campbell, that you're very tired. You've been traveling all day by train to begin with and then by steamer. And I'm sure you're ready for your supper and ready for your bed. But uh, I wonder if you would be prepared to address a meeting in the parish church at 9 o'clock tonight on our way home. It'll be a short meeting and then we'll make for the manse and you'll get your supper and bed and rest until tomorrow evening. Well, it will interest you to know that I never got that supper. Never got it. I got to the church. We got to the church about quarter to nine. And to find about 300 people gathered. I would say about 300 people. And uh, I gave an address. I don't know if any of you have read my book, God's Answer. You'll find the address that I gave on that great night in that book. It's a fast sermon in the book. Nothing really happened during the service. It was a good meeting, a sense of God, a consciousness of his spirit moving, but nothing beyond that. So I pronounced the benediction, and uh, we are leaving the church, I would say, about a quarter to eleven. A two hours meeting, of course, that was nothing. In Louis. Just as I'm walking down the aisle, along with this young deacon who read the psalm in the barn, he suddenly stood in the aisle, and looking up toward the heavens, he said, God, you can't fail us. God, you can't fail us. You promised to pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. God, you can't fail us. I'm standing beside him, realizing that I am by the side of a man who appears to know God better than I do. My dear people, we've got to be honest. We've got to be honest. And I felt that here was a young man who knew God in a way that perhaps I didn't know him. He could speak to me in that way. Could I speak to him in that way? He's now on his knees in the aisle and he's still praying. And then falls into a trance again. And just then the door opens. It's now eleven o'clock. The door of the church opens. And uh, the local blacksmith comes back into the church and says, Mr. Campbell, something wonderful has happened. Oh, we were praying that God would pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground, and listen, he's done it, he's done it. When I went to the door of the church, I saw a congregation of approximately 600 people. 600 people, where had they come from? What had happened? I believe that, that very night, God 
God swept in in Pentecostal power. The power of the Holy Ghost. And what happened in the early days of the apostles was happening now in the parish of Barba. Over a hundred young people were at a dance in the parish hall. They were in thinking of God of eternity. God was not in all their thoughts. They were there to have a good night. When suddenly the power of God fell upon the dance, the music ceased, and in a matter of minutes the hall was empty. They fled from the hall as a man fleeing from a plague, and they made for the church. They're now standing outside. Oh yes, they saw light in the church. That was the house of God. They were going to it and they went. Men and women that had gone to bed, rose, dressed, and made for the church. Nothing in the nature of publicity. No mention of a special effort except an intimation from the pulpit and Sabbath that a certain man was going to conduct a series of meetings in the parish covering ten days. But God took the situation in hand. Oh, he became his own publicity agent. And a hunger and a thirst gripped the people. Six hundred of them now are at the church standing outside. This dear man, the blacksmith, turned to me and said, I think we should sing a psalm. Of course, in Lewis, they don't sing hymns until after the benediction. You can sing to your heart's content then, but not until the benediction is pronounced. You sing the psalms of David. Oh, how they sing them. How they sing them. So he gave out Psalm 102, when Zion's bondage, God turned back as men that dreamed where we. Filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongues, with melody and they sang and they sang and they sang verse after verse oh what sing what sing and then the doors were opened and the congregation flocked back into the church and now the church is crowded the church to seat over 800 people is now packed to capacity it's now going on for midnight when I managed to make my way through the crowd along the aisle to the pulpit, I found a young woman, a graduate of Aberdeen University, a teacher in the grammar school, was lying prostrate on the floor of the pulpit, praying, Oh God, is there mercy for me? Oh God, is there mercy for me? She was one of those of the dance. But she's now lying on the floor of the pulpit crying to God for mercy. That meeting continued until four o'clock in the morning. I couldn't tell you how many were saved that night, but of this I am sure and certain that at least five young men who were saved in that church that night are today ministers in the Church of Scotland, having gone through university and college. They are now ministers. They were born again in that meeting. At four o'clock, we decided to make for the man. Now, of course, you understand, we, we make no appeal. You never need to make an appeal or an altar call in revival, why the roadside becomes an altar. We just leave men and women to make their way to God themselves, and after all, that's the right way. God can look after his own. Oh, God can look after his own, and when God takes the situation in hand, I tell you, he does a thorough work. He does a thorough work. So we left them there, and just as I'm leaving the church, a young man came to me 
Uh, and said, Mr. Campbell, uh, I would like you to go to the police station. I said, the police station, what's wrong? Oh, it says there's nothing wrong, but there must be at least 400 people gathered around the police station just now. Now, the sergeant there was a God-fearing man. He was in the meeting. But uh, people knew that this was a home, a house that feared God. And then, next to the police station, the cottage in which the two old women lived. I, I believe that that had something to do with the madness, the power that drew men. There was a coachload at that meeting. A coachload had come over 12 miles to be there. Now, go to any of them today, ask them uh, why, what happened, who arranged the bus. They couldn't tell you. But they found themselves grouping together and someone saying, oh, what about going to Barbas? I don't know, but I have a hunger in my heart to go there. I can't explain it. They couldn't explain it. But God had the situation in hand. This is revival, dear people. This is the sovereign act of God. This is the moving of God's spirit. I believe in answer to the prevailing prayer of men and women who believe that God was a covenant-keeping God but must be true to his covenant engagement. I went along. I went along to that meeting. As I'm walking along that country road, we had to walk about a mile. I heard someone praying by the roadside. I could hear this man crying to God for mercy. And I went over and there were four young men on their knees by the roadside. Yes, they were at the dam. But they're now there crying to God for mercy. One of them was under the influence of drink. It was a young man. He wasn't 20 years of age. But that night God saved him. And he's today the parish minister of Ugin. A parish minister of Ugin, university trained, college trained, a man of God, converted in the revival with eleven of his office bearers. A wonderful congregation. Well, he was saved that night. Now, when I got to the police station, I saw something that will live with me as long as I live. I didn't preach. There was no need to preach. We didn't even sing. The people are crying to God for mercy. All the confessions that were made, the confessions that were made, there was one old man crying out, Oh God, hell is too good for me. Hell is too good for me. This is Holy Ghost Foundation. And mark you, that was on the very first night of the mighty demonstration that shook the earth. Oh, let me say again, that was in the beginning of the revival. The, the, the revival began in a prayer burden. Revival began in an awareness of God. Revival began when the Holy Ghost began to grip men. But that was how it began. And of course, after that, we were at it. Night and day, churches crowded. A messenger would come, I remember one night, it was now after three o'clock in the morning, a messenger came to say that the churches were crowded in another parish 15 miles away, crowded at that hour in the morning, and we went uh, to this parish minister, along with several other ministers, oh, I thank God for the ministers of Lewis, how they responded to the call of God, how they threw themselves into the effort, and God blessed them for it. We went, and I found myself preaching in a large church, a church that would seat a thousand. And the Spirit of God was moving, oh, moving, in a mighty way I could see them falling on their knees, I could hear them crying to God for mercy. And I could hear those outside praying. And that continued for a two, two hours. 
Then we are leaving the church when someone came to me to tell me that a very large number of people had gathered on a field. They couldn't get into the church. They couldn't get into any of the churches. And they were gathered on a field. Along with the other ministers, I decided to go to the field. And here I saw this enormous crowd standing there so gripped by a power that they could not explain. But the interesting thing about that meeting was the sight that I saw. The headmaster of a secondary school in the parish is lying on his face on the ground, crying to God for mercy. Oh, deeply convicted of his desperate need. And on either side of them, two young girls, I say about 16 years of age, last night in Barber can save you tonight. It is true that when a man comes into vital relationship with Jesus Christ, his supreme desire is to win others. Oh, to win others. And they were there that night to win their master and the woman. Oh, God swept into his life, I believe, in answer to the prayer of four young girls, 16 years of age, who had a burden. Who had a burden. So that was how the revival began. And uh, that is how it continued to begin with for five weeks. The first wave of the revival continued for five weeks, and then there was a lull, perhaps a lull of about a week. Oh, the churches are still crowded, the people are still seeking after God, prayer meetings are being held all over the parishes. It was the custom there that those who found the Savior at night would be at the prayer meeting at midday. A prayer meeting every day then at midday. At that time, all work stopped. For two hours, looms were silent. For two hours, work stopped on the fields. And men gathered for prayer. And it was then that you got to know those who had found the Savior on the previous night. You didn't need to make an appeal. They made their way to the prayer meeting to praise God for his salvation. Well, that continued. It continued for almost three years until the whole of the island was swept by the mighty power of God. I couldn't tell you how many. I never checked the number. I was afraid to do that, always remembering what David did. I left the records with God. But of this I know but at least 75% of those who were born again during the revival were born again before they came near a church. Before they had any word from me or from any of the other ministers. I, I, I can think just now of a certain village. It was a village of weavers. And there was a row of cottages by the roadside. There were seven of them all together. And in every cottage, a loom and a weaver. One morning, just as the men were being called for breakfast, it was discovered that the seven of them were lying prostrate behind their loom. Lying on their faces behind the loom. And all of them in a trance. Now, I, I, I can't explain that. But, of this I am certain, that this was of God, because the seven men were saved that day. Now, I should say six of them saved that day, one of them on the following day. But they came to understand that something supernatural had taken possession of them. 
and an awareness of God with them, and a hunger for them, and they're crying for God, to God for nothing. And God swept in. I was visiting them recently. I happened to be up in the Hebrides, and what a joy it was to listen to them tell again of that wonderful experience when God swept into the seven houses. My dear people, that's revival. I mean, so different from our special ed. <coughs> so apart altogether from man's best endeavor. God is in the field and miracle is happening. Now, uh, perhaps I ought to now go on to some of the features that characterize this remarkable movement. Well, already I have mentioned to you that uh, men were found in transit. Perhaps I ought to say this, that in the Louis revival we never saw anybody healed. That wasn't a feature of it. We never heard anybody speaking in tongues in a strange language. Uh, personally, I never heard anybody speak in tongues until a year or two ago, and that was in England. We knew nothing whatsoever about such manifestations. Don't misunderstand me. I believe in every gift mentioned in the Word of God. But uh, it wasn't God's plan or God's purpose that we should be visited in that way, and we went. But we saw strange manifestations. Now, I, I think just now of uh, a certain island up until then, God hadn't moved on this island, one of the smaller islands, perhaps an island of perhaps 600 souls. And I was asked to go to this island to officiate at a communion. Now, a communion in Louis is just like one of your conventions. We begin with a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and then uh, on Thursday, uh, Thursday, the fast day when schools are closed, shops are closed, no work is done. It's just like another Sabbath. At Thursday, Friday again is testimony day when men give their testimony. Uh, they ask the women to be silent. You never hear a woman give a testimony of such meeting. And that's the men speak. However, I'm glad to say that many of the dear women got glorious liberty during the revival and they're uh, meeting for prayers and praying with the men today. Uh, that is a transformation that has taken place uh, subsequent to the revival. Well, I think I can say that. It's because of this custom family worship. Well, this man who had that wasn't a Christian, but a God-fearing man. So he gathered in his house. I would say there would be about 30 of them including the five ministers of the Church of God, men who were burdened, longing to see God moving and reviving. And we are praying, and know the going was hard. At least I felt it hard. It came to about between 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning when I turned again to this blacksmith that I've already rehearsed. Oh, he was a prince in the parish. And I said to him, John, I feel that God would have me call upon you to pray up until then. He was silent. He was silent. And that dear man began. He must have prayed for about half an hour. For about half an hour. When he paused for a second or so, and then looking up toward the heavens, he cried, God, do you know that your honor is at stake? Do you know that your honor is at stake? You promised to pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground, and God, you're not doing it. And my dear people, could we pray like that? Ah, but here was a man who could. Here was a man who could. And then he went on to say this, there are five ministers in this meeting, and I don't know where one of them stands in your presence, not even Mr. Campbell. Oh, he was an honest man. But if I know anything at all about my own poor heart, I think I can say, and I think that you know, that I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty to see the devil defeated in this fight. I'm thirsty to see the community gripped. 
as you great burden. I long for revival, and God, you're not doing it. And I'm thirsty, and you promise to pour water on me. Then a pause, and then he cries. God, I now take upon myself to challenge you to fulfill your covenant engagement. That was nearing two o'clock in the morning. What happened? The house shook. A jug on a sideboard fell on to the floor and broke. A minister beside me said, an earth tremor. And I said, yes, Margot. But I had my own thoughts. My mind went back to the act chapter 4 when the way the place was shaken. When John Smith stopped praying at 20 minutes past two, I pronounced the benediction and left it to the house. What did I see? The whole community alive. Men carrying chairs, women carrying stools, and asking if the room falls in the churches on the Arnold Revival Boker. And oh, what a sweeping revival. I don't believe there was a single house in the village that wasn't shaken by God. I went into another farmhouse. I was thirsty, I was tired, I was needing something to drink. And I went in to ask for a drink of milk, and I found nine women in the kitchen crying to God for mercy. Nine of them. The power of God swept. And here is a little boy. Oh, he's kneeling by a pizza. And he's crying to God for mercy. One of the elders goes over to him and prays over him. And little Donald McPhail, the Evan Roberts of Louis came to know the Savior, and I believe more souls were brought to Christ through that young lad's prayers than through the preaching of all the ministers on the island in Jerusalem. God knew it. He was the boy that prayed. I gazed upon an open door. Now that night, do you know, that the drinking house was closed. The drinking house was closed. That's the way back, 52, 1952, and it's never been open since. I was back some time ago, and an old man, an old elder, pointed at this house, this biggish house with its windows boarded up. He says, Mr. Campbell, do you see that house over there? And I say, well, he says, that was the drinking house of the past. Do you know that last week at our prayer meeting, 14 of the men who drank there were praying of me. My dear people, that's revival. That God at work. Miracle. Supernatural. Beyond human explanation. God. And I'm fully persuaded, dear people, I'm fully persuaded that unless we see something like that happening, the average man will stagger back from our effort our conferences, conventions, and crusades will stagger back disappointed, disillusioned, and despairing. But oh, if something happened that demonstrates God, and the communist will hide his head in shame. Oh, I remember one night I saw seven communists. Up until then, they would sit in your face, talk about religion, the joke of the mass. Educated man, so many of them are not I. Educated man. Wouldn't go near a church. But dear old Peggy had a vision one night. And I think I ought to tell you this. I hope I'm not keeping you too long. It'll not be very long now. She had a vision. And in the vision she saw seven men from this particular community. From this center of activity. <coughs> born again and becoming pillars in the church of her father. She sent for me and uh, told me that God had revealed to her that he was going to move in this particular village. Oh, yes, there were communists there, there were godless men there. Uh, but what was that to God when God began to work? He would deal with that. So she went on talking like this. 
Well, I said, Peggy, I know leading to go to that village. You know that there's no church there, and the schoolmaster is one of those men, and he would never dream of giving me the schoolhouse for a meeting. And I've no leadings to go. You know what he said to me? Mr. Campbell, if you were living as near to God as you ought to be, he would reveal the secret to you all. And I took it from the Lord. Oh, my dear people, it's good to take the word of the you. It's good to see yourself as others see you. That was how I felt. And I said, Peggy, would you mind if I called for the parish minister and together we'll spend the morning with you in prayer? Oh, I'll be happy, she said. I'll be happy. So we came and we knelt with her. And she began to pray, and in her prayer she said this, Lord, you remember, you remember what you told me this morning when we had that conversation together? Oh, how near she was to God. She said, I'm just after telling Mr. Campbell about it, but he's not prepared to take it. You give him wisdom because the man badly needs it. That is what she said. The man badly needs it. And of course she was taking truth. Of course I need it. I need it to be taught. And I was at the feet of a woman that knew God in an intimate way. And I was prepared to listen. So I said, Peggy, when will I go to that village? You'll go tomorrow. What time? Seven o'clock. When am I to hold the meeting? You go to the village and leave the gathering of the people to God and he'll do it. And I went to the village and when I arrived, I found a crowd round a seven-room bungalow. I found five ministers waiting for me. And the house was so crowded that we couldn't get in. Indeed, we couldn't get near it. And I stood on a hillock in front of the main door. I give out my text the times of this ignorant God winked out, but now commandeth men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained. I preached for about ten minutes when one of the ministers came to me and said, Mr. Campbell, you remember what you spoke about at five o'clock this morning out in the field in that wonderful meeting? When you tried to help those that were seeking God, I happen to speak from John 10 and 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know that they follow me. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He says, could you not go to the end of the house? There are some men there, and we are afraid that they'll go mental. They're in such a state. Oh, they're mighty sinners, and they know it. They're mighty sinners, and they know it. They're spoken of here as communists. And they say that three of them were here in the United States and went back communists. Nearly say that in person. I went and I saw seven men. The seven men that Peggy saw. And they're crying to God for now. The seven of them were saved within a matter of days. And were you to go to that parish today, you would see a church with a stone wall built round it, Tarn Academy Road to the front of the church into the vestry, heated by electricity, lit by electricity, and all done by the seven men who became pillars in the church of Peggy's father. Oh, my dear people, that God. The minister saw two young men on their knees in the field, crying to God, and he recognized the two pipers that were to have played at a concert and dance under the auspices of the Nothing Association of the island in his parish. He turned to his wife and he said, Isn't that wonderful? There are two pipers that were advertised to play in the parish hall tonight. There they are, crying to God for mercy. Come on, we'll go home and we'll go to the dance and we'll tell them what is happening. 
So off he went. Oh, this is a man of God. Off he went. Along with his wife, most of 15 miles, went to the dam. And there weren't a tall, clean, fit appearing. He was there to be sermon. They knew that he wasn't there to dance. Oh, they knew the man. However, he went in. When a loud came in the dancing, he stepped onto the floor and he said, Young folks, something very wonderful has happened tonight. The Smith Pipers were to be here. The two bro brothers were to be here, please. They're crying to God for mercy and barber. Suddenly, still a man. Not a word. And then he spoke again. Young folk, would you sing a song with me? Yes, said one young man, if you lead the singing yourself. And he gave out Psalm 50 for God, it depicted as a flame of fire. And while singing that song, the power of God fell upon the dance. And I understand that only three who were there last night remained unsaved. The first young man to cry to God for mercy was really a boy. Just last year he was inducted to one of the largest parishes in Scotland. Found the Savior that night with many others. Oh, my dear people, this is the doing of God. And you ask me, as this I close, you ask me, now, uh, uh, what is the fruit of the, of the movement? Well, some little time ago, the parish minister was asked, to give a report in the record of the Church of God. He was asked to give a report on the fruits of the revival. And the fruits of the revival. Did they stand? Any backsliding on this? Now this is what he wrote. I will confine my remarks uh, to one parish, my own parish. I'll allow the other ministers to be very but let me speak of my own past. In a certain village, 122 young people found the seed. And I'm not talking now about the middle age or the old. They're wonderful. But I'm thinking of the young people, 122, all of them over the age of 17. They found the seed then, during the first wave of the revival. Today I can say that they're growing like flowers in the garden of God. There's not a single backslide of a man. Now, my dear people, that's true. That's true. But oh, if you knew the young people that have gone forth from that community to our Bible colleges who are today missionaries in this, that, and the other part of the world who came into saving relationships Growing, he says, like flowers in the garden of God. Oh, how we praise God for the stream of young people that have gone into the ministry. I've sometimes said that the Paul St. Louis produced nothing but one young girl, a wild, wild girl, just 17 years of age, an outstanding singer, frequently singing at all the big con concerts in Glasgow. She was outstanding and is outstanding. God saved her. She went to a Bible school and was trained. And today I have no hesitation in saying that she is among the leading Bible expositors in this. I'm not saying a lot. She's just now in South Africa addressing conferences and conventions, has been instrumental in bringing blessings to scores of ministers. And she was the fruit of the moon. I'll never forget the night that she prayed in a meeting. Remember, she was steeped in the doctrine of Calvinism. Louis is Calvinist. Oh, she was teaching me. She was brought up in a God-fearing home. The father and mother weren't Christians, but they were saved at that time. And she's now on her knees in her room. It's three o'clock in the morning, and she begins to pray, and she says, God, 
I'm turning from the ways of the world. You'll never see me on a concert platform again. I'll follow your people. I'll be with them in the prayer meeting. I'll never go back to the ways of the world. God, that is what I'm purposing doing. Though at the end you send me to hell, that is what I desire. God, six months after that, said, God, six months after that, saw them. Oh, I remember the night that the Holy Ghost fell upon us at a communion service. She lifted her two hands like this, and she cried, Oh, bridegroom, bridegroom of my heart. So says it all. Bridegroom, bridegroom of my heart. Possess it all, and God, the Holy Ghost, came upon her in such a way that she began to cry, Oh, God, hold your hand, my young body can't contain. God, hold your hand, my young body can't contain. That was God. That's the truth. And for what we are seeing today in that silence, a movement again in Antinus, he asked the minister recently when I was at the General Assembly, now can you explain it? Have you explained this movement in any way? Yes, he says, I can. I can, and I believe this has broken out because of the steadfastness of the young people who found the Savior during the big revival years ago. The steadfastness of the young people. I can say without fear of contradiction that I could count on my five, my ten fingers, all who dropped off from the prayer meetings, of course, they're scattered all over the world. They're in the mission field, they're in different places today. But according to the ministers in Lewis and in other places, they are standing true to the God of the covenant. Through to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my dear people, that's the story. And uh, I tell it because I fear that another man has been going about the state telling the story of the revival, writing books about it. And I regret to say that statements have been made by him and written in his book that are not true to fact. But that is the story of the revival that can bear the light of examination. God did it and we bless him. We thank our Heavenly Father this morning for this inspiring experience of listening to the work of God. We certainly are in a dry and a thirsty land, not just America, but in this generation in which we live, a dry and thirsty land where no water is. But we thank thee again that thy promise is that the river of God is full of water, and our minds go back to repeated times in history when it has pleased thee to descend. We think of the invasion of thy spirit, even on a greater scale in the days of Whitfield and Wesley, when England, it seemed, would be swallowed by the vicious revolution that had made France bloody and disintegrated it. And yet you raised up a man. You raised up a number of men, Whitfield. And not only Whitfield, but others immediately before and after. <clears throat> we think of the great Yorkshire evangelist, we think of uh, men like Gideon Usley and others that came along in the power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, we say again that there is nothing too hard for thee. We look around and we don't see a cloud as big as a man's hand in the sky, except of course this move of thy spirit in Indonesia. We thank thee for every meeting, we thank thee for every con conference, we thank thee for every Bible convention, and we have to say that mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. 
Grant, O Lord, that we shall meditate upon this truth. We shall go back to thy word and we shall dare to grow in confidence and challenge thee as this boy did and as this blacksmith did to manifest thy power in this evil day in which we lay. We say again with the psalmist, O thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. Cause thy face to shine upon us and we shall be saved. So keep us in the spirit today. May we do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. And we'll give thee praise in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.